Hey, what's going on? I am Will Button from DevOps for Developers. And in this video, I'm going to give you seven tips using DevOps practices that will make your application better, more scalable, more resilient, and make it easier for you to deploy your code. So let's get started with tip number one. And it seems kind of obvious to some people, but it's really worth pointing out that your code needs to live in some kind of repository. Now it can be GitHub or Bitbucket or it really doesn't matter, but it has to live in a repository somewhere. And the second part of that is it needs to be a repository that you actually own. If you use third party vendors for writing code or outsource your development, you really want this to be a repository that you own because I've seen scenarios where relationships fall apart and then you're stuck as a business unable to move forward with your application because you're busy negotiating the release of your code from this third party relationship. Tip number two, automate your development onboarding experience. And what I mean by this is you may have encountered scenarios in the past whenever you start working on a new project you have to install all of these different software packages like Apache or Java or PHP or Postgres and then it's specific versions of them and then we've customized it so you got to do these little tweaks and different things like that. It's unnecessary. You know, it just delays the amount of time before you can get that new person doing something productive that you're paying them to do. My favorite way to solve this problem is through the use of make files and Docker Compose because doing this I can keep those files in the repository along with the application code and whenever we bring on a new developer they just get access to the repo they check out the code and they type a single command like make up and it brings everything to life you can specify all of your dependencies all of your configuration in those docker compose files and then script over different things like bringing it to life and grabbing data that they're going to need to run that application as well the other benefit to this is making sure that everyone's on the same version. For example, if you're building a Node.js application and right now you're using Node.js 14, you can specify that in your Compose configuration file so that everyone else is using the same version. And then when you're ready to jump from Node 14 to Node 16, it'll go through your regular development workflow where you make the change to the code, you open up a pull request, it gets reviewed, merged into main, everyone else pulls down those changes and now everyone is running the same version of node even though you just upgraded it tip number three you need some place to run your code and again this is another one that's like kind of obvious but what i want to point out in this tip is choosing where to run your code there's all kinds of options ranging from aws to azure to gcp to heroku digital ocean and hundreds of other choices as well which one's right for you and i use two criteria to determine what the right answer to that is the first is what resources do you have available on your team do you have people on your team with strong networking Linux and sysadmin skills. If you don't, I tend to steer people away from things like AWS, GCP, and Azure because it just introduces complexity and management points that require skills that you don't have on your team. And you can still run and, and manage your application using something like Heroku or DigitalOcean that doesn't require those skills. Now, the other part of this is scalability. How big and how performant does your application need to be? If you've got a new application and you're just starting out, you've only got a few users and hopefully that will grow over time, but let's deal with managing hundreds of thousands of users when we get to that point. When we're just launching out, let's just do the simplest thing to get it live in a safe, secure, and scalable format. And the best way to do that, in my opinion, is using something like DigitalOcean or Heroku or Serverless or one of those guys. Now later, as your application grows and your team grows, you'll have new skills and new problems to address, and you can always migrate to someone different at that time. Now while we're setting this up, we want to set the process of getting the code from the repository to that hosted service in an automated fashion. Right? And we want to do this for a couple of reasons. We want to do so 
by minimizing the number of people who have access to production. And that's not a trust issue, that's just a best practices issue because you want to make sure that anything that happens out in production goes through an approval process, a defined workflow so that you can track and audit any changes to it. Now we also wanna automate that so that it follows a defined consistent process of going to production. Imagine a scenario where I make some changes merge them into the main branch, and then I deploy from my laptop or my workstation and jump on a plane for two weeks for vacation, right? If everything went well with that deploy, no big deal. If something goes wrong, we got a problem. We got a problem because we don't know who I notified that I was doing a deploy. It may be difficult to track what changes I made during that deploy. And we've also lost any logs or feedback that happened during that deploy process. So we want to automate that and use something else to do that deploy. And you can use your CI CD workflow to do this deploy. Um, if that's not an option for you, you can use a jump server or a centralized server that everyone logs into and does the deploy from there. And any actions in addition to the deploy, you want to make sure that those are automated and scripted as well. And I'm referring specifically to things like sending a message to your team, whether that's through email, Microsoft Teams, Slack, Discord, whatever you use to communicate, make sure that everyone knows a deploy is in process. And ideally, the feedback or the status or result of that deploy goes through that same communication channel as well. Now this just ensures that humans don't forget steps or overlook steps and when a deploy goes wrong, because ultimately it will, we have the best possible scenario available for figuring out what happened and correcting that and moving forward. Tip number four, logging. We just spent a lot of time and effort in tip number three, minimizing the number of people who have access to production and automating our deploy scenario. So we've got logs that are happening out on production, but we gotta get those out of that application or out of that environment, someplace where that the rest of the team can see those logs. In addition to that, you wanna write more logs than you think are necessary for your application, right? There's like seven different log levels you can use, ranging from uh, info to warning to critical to debug. And so you wanna write logs for all of those scenarios and then choose the appropriate log level for that statement. One of the things I like to do is control the log level on my application through an environment variable set on my production servers. So now in a everyday world, we're just running with our log level set at the info level, but in those scenarios when we need more logging information, we can change the value of that log level to warning or to debug or critical or whatever we need to do and then restart the application so that it picks up that change to the environment variable and now we're getting the additional logging that we want to work on that issue without having to log in to our servers and make changes there or do a code deploy. All right, tip number five, monitoring. So in addition to our logging, we need monitoring and we need the base level monitoring things like CPU and memory and disk space. Those are the ones that we wanna monitor on our server level, but we also want application specific monitoring as well. For example, if we're building an API server, we want to monitor the latency or the response time whenever someone makes a request through one of our API endpoints. You also want some kind of application tracing or framework specific monitoring as well so that whenever you're trying to do those advanced debugging or troubleshooting scenarios, you can get some metrics that are specific to the performance of your code. Now, a lot of times this is called application tracing or application performance monitoring or APM, and there's a range of different solutions you can use to implement this, starting with building and rolling your own, to using open source tools like Jaeger, to third-party tools like New Relic or Datadog. Just depends on how much time, money, and resources you have as to which one of those fits your needs. Number six, now that we've got our monitoring going on, we want to add alerting as well. One of my pet peeves is getting notified of a production outage from our customers instead of through my alerting system. But if you don't have an alerting system, 
that's really the only way, right? So let's address that by adding alerting. And we want two different thresholds for different things in our system. We want a warning threshold that lets us know something is getting outside of its normal characteristics. And then we want a warning or an alert threshold that tells us we need to drop what we're doing and go address this situation. The exact metrics that you need or the exact things that you need to alert on are going to vary based on the type of application that you're working on. But one thing I will urge you to avoid is driving yourself into an alert fatigue situation. And by that, I mean you have a lot of alerts going off that aren't actionable. If you get an alert and there's nothing you can do about it, that alert needs to be turned off or changed to a different value. Because what will happen over time is you'll see these alerts come in and you'll say, oh, that one can be ignored. Oh, that one can be ignored. Oh yeah, that one can be ignored too. But then somewhere in that stream was an alert that shouldn't have been ignored, but because you're used to ignoring alerts, you ignored that one as well. And now we're right back in that scenario where we're getting notified of production issues from our customers instead of from our alerting scenario or our alerting system. Last one, number seven, backups. And I'm specifically talking about backups of our data at this point, backing up our databases, backing up our file systems, backing up our non-code assets that are needed to run and deliver value to our customers. And it's not enough here to just have the backup. If you've never restored that backup, you don't have a backup. So it's two parts. One, you have to start backing things up. And two, you need to restore that backup either to a production itself or to a production replica or to your staging system, just somewhere so that you know when disaster strikes that the thing that you're backing up is what you need to bring it back to life. And this just avoids scenarios where you're doing backups, but then when you need that backup, you find out that either the backup wasn't correct or it's in the wrong format or you didn't back up everything that your server needs to bring it back to life. All right, there you go. Seven tips for implementing DevOps practices into your application. I hope you found those helpful. If you would like to learn more about DevOps tips, DevOps practices, and how to implement DevOps into your existing application, I'd love to see you check out my channel, DevOps for Developers. And thanks for watching, and I'll see y'all later.